You see, I've used this technique for so long, not only in my personal life, as I shared with you, you know, the way I grew up and the way that I was able to get things that I, I wanted, but now I actually use it in communicating through my prospects in getting what I want and what I want them to do is not pay attention to the rate fee or payment. And this is what has allowed me to literally avoid any objections on rate fees or costs. And I believe it's effective because I change their belief patterns. I shift their focus away from what the mainstream has trained them to focus on, and that's rate and fees. And instead, I have them focus on me being the only solution because all I've done was simply expose and control their emotion. Emotional intelligence is basically very useful in the, in, in the art of selling because selling in itself is the ability to understand one's emotions and then transfer emotion to them. So you're communicating. Anytime we communicate, typically it's because we want something in return, whether it's compliance, whether it's an answer, whether it's to have somebody do something that we want them to do. Ultimately, we are communicating. That's the whole reason why we call people, isn't it? It's the only reason why we typically communicate is because we want something. We're communicating our desires. And how it, com how it, how it translates over into our work or into our daily job is that we have this ability to, to extract someone's desire. And I'm talking about the con sales conversation. So what I'm going to share with you are different key words that can actually help you expose one's true intent. You see, the reason why I believe a lot of sales are not being won today or actually are being missed today is because we as salesmen usually get caught up with our own sense of confidence in our delivery, meaning that we sometimes are not confident enough within our service or our product because we believe, and what we believe is, is our reality, we believe that we're not serving our prospects with what they want. And this all starts off with our immediate sales conversation. You might call it the 1003 application. You may call it the initial sales origination call, the inbound call, or the outbound call. And when we engage with a prospect, typically we are taught as salesmen to serve serve that person with what they ask for, what they want, almost like a waiter. And this is the, the saying goes where, you know, you can't be an order taker, you have to be a closer, you have to be a salesman. And the meaning behind that message is that if we order take, meaning that if we, if we try and find what prospects ask us for, what their wants are, I want the lowest rate, I want the, I want the no cost option, <laughs> I want whatever was advertised, we will find ourselves in constant battle with having to explain why marketing is the way marketing is. And you know by now that marketing is always going to be that source of information that creates interest. And that's why most marketing pieces that have to do with our line of work has a lot of fine print. Within that fine print, it in short, it tells you that you have to fit a specific cookie cutter shape. But it is our job as a salesman to, to overcome that challenge. And this is why when we have prospects calling in for a 15 year fixed rate, rate and term, but they only qualify for a 30 year term, we can look at that personally in two distinct ways. We can look at it as, oh no, they'll never buy, or but that's not what they want. And this translates in our energy and our delivery when we get down to actually selling that service. And so my goal here is to share with you how you can take the communication that you, that you receive from your prospect initially and turn it into a message that creates a solution. Because I believe that a solution is actually what they need. And if you look at your job in a way where you don't sell price, you don't sell rate, you don't sell fees, you'll have an upper hand against your competition because they believe that they sell rate, price, and fees. And this is why the competitors that you have to go up against with 
are typically doing the opposite of what I share and teach here at Sales Remastered. So let's start off with the initial sales conversation and I'm going to teach you how to pick up different pieces of someone's emotional intelligence, their emotional state. And it does have to do with the way you craft your message and how you craft that engagement. So I urge you, if you have not yet downloaded a copy of the sales script, there's a link below the video or in the profile if you're catching me on Instagram or if you, you know, try to catch me on Facebook or even here. You're going to notice there's notes where I ask you to download a copy of the free sales script. When you request the copy, be sure to use your own personal email address as your work email may kick it back. But that, that free PDF download is, it is a sneak peek of what emotional intelligence is all about. And you're going to notice that within that script, at no point do I ask the prospect what they're looking to do or what they want. Because I understand that my job is not to serve what they want. My job is to serve a solution to what they need. And so you'll notice that the scripting is set up in a way where it allows me to discard them and remove their resistance. Where I find a lot of sales representatives have trouble in the initial conversation is because they ask one simple question that changes the dynamics of the entire conversation. And that question is, how can I help you? This, this question changes the dynamics of your engagement because it allows them to, to basically make the topic of that conversation. And so if we ask one of our prospects, well, how can I help you? Of course, we already know because we are experienced. We've done this countless times before. The, the prospects are always going to ask for typically something that is not available, whether it's a lower rate or the no cost option. And because we are in a service-oriented profession, we feel instinctively the, the need to explain why they can't get that. Or we, we try to think of a way to explain why that's not available. And the problem with that is, though, is that when you meet a prospect for the first time and you explain that you don't have what, what it is that they're calling in for, we're going to find ourselves in a debate it's more or less like a, uh, like a chess game. And so this is where I think that we sometimes view our, our prospects as opponents. They're our, you know, they're our opponent and when we're playing a game against them. And that in itself will set you up on a wrong mindset. It'll, it'll set the energy of that conversation to be completely off of where it should be and where it should be is to create a connection and create a bond. So this is how you're able to extract the right information and actually pick up on some signs that your prospects are clearly giving you. And we can look at our initial sales conversation in a whole new different light by the end of this stream. As a matter of fact, when the next time that you go into a sales conversation today, I want you to look at it as a way of learning exactly how to sell that particular person. You see, we have this advantage where we can actually find out how to sell our prospects. But sometimes we don't look at it that way because we are too busy, worried about objections that, are, that haven't even happened yet. But I assure you through experience, and I've been doing this for a very long time, that the prospects do not buy into price, rate, or fees. That is what they ask for because they don't know any other questions to ask. But if we find a way to position ourselves as a consultant, as, a, as, as more or less a, a, a topic expert, like a subject matter expert, then we can carry ourselves as, as like a physician would or, or a consultant would. Can think of like a, like a CPA or a dentist or a doctor. You see, when we go to these individuals as experts, we are in their hands, right? Because they have information that protects us. And if we can position ourselves instead of a salesman, instead of a loan officer, instead of a loan consultant, a senior LO or a junior LO, and instead position ourselves as someone who can educate them and help them protect themselves from wasting time, uh, avoiding wasting money, and giving them the idea that we're there to protect them and their time and their money, then I think that we can actually attract and create a bond in a whole new different way. Well, at the same time, we'll be able to discover what it is exactly they need. Now, 
in order for this to effectively work, you're going to have to retrain your mind of how you hear things. So from the, for example, if it's, if it's hard for you to stop asking, how can I help you? And that's just, it's just natural because it's like muscle memory. It's going to take a while. And so if you find yourself asking that still and they say, I want the lowest rate, I need you to hear it in a different way. I need you to hear it in a way where they're not talking about a lower rate. I need you to have empathy, which is another strength of emotional intelligence is empathize and understand that not everyone is like you. Not everyone understands this game like you. And so how we understand this game is that we know that the market determines the rates. But our prospects don't necessarily understand that. What our prospects do understand, because they're not NMLS licensed, they're not professionals, they're not experts within our trade like we are, is that our prospects only understand that they can lower their mortgage payment if they get a lower rate. Does that make sense? This is why sometimes you'll come across prospects who are asking for a shorter term, like they want that 15-year term, they want that 15-year payment, but they cannot understand why the payment goes up. It's because we understand the amortization schedule. We understand why is because they got a shorter time, right? So we have a choice where we can basically force feed them what they want, or we can expose what they need and serve a solution. And I promise you the latter is going to position you more favorably in selling any rate, any fee with any reputation. And it all has to do with emotional intelligence. And so through the first conversation, you're going to pick up on little signs that they're going to say to you, and I'm going to give you certain techniques that you could sprinkle throughout your conversation and throughout your sales pitch. Starting off with the sales conversation, you're going to hear the common requests of, I want a lower rate. And our job is not to react to that. Our job is to agree and, 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 and communicate with them, okay, great. That's exactly what I'm going to send over to you. But before I send it out, let me just make sure I can help you first. If I can, I'm going to send to your email exactly what I could do. And if not, I'm going to help you save some time and I'm going to point you in the right direction. That's exactly how the opening goes in my sales script. Why that works is because it addresses their concern of them not wanting to waste time, of them not having to get anything that they don't need. And that's ultimately empathy in its finest because that's what prospects are guarding themselves from. You see, empathy is, is viewing it from their eyes too and seeing it through their experience or their understanding. And when you find yourself having that handicap or having that advantage of learning how to have them follow you, you can do this through tonality. You see, tonality, there's a way of, of, of making your tone in a way that builds curiosity. There's a way to deliver a tonality that makes them want to follow you. So, for example, you can say, oh, yeah, watch here. Let me show you. Just that, that tonality, that rhythm, that energy makes people attract towards you, right? Where in the same breath, I could talk like this and then I can also lower my voice and go really super low like this. This will have them engage and give you even more attention and make them believe that what you're telling them is just that much more important. You see, there's a way to control someone's emotions. There's a way to not only expose it, but identify it and leverage it. And so in your conversation, when you have them follow you, a good question to plant within your conversation is saying, you know, just out of curiosity, when you do lower your payment, what's your plan with the savings? And what they tell you after that is going to share with you exactly what they need. And it could be for various things. They could say, well, I need the savings so that I can use to pay off my credit card debt. That answer then becomes your bridge to expose what their real need is. And so you could say, okay, great. Well, how much do you currently send on your credit card debt? And then they'll say, well, I send about $500 per month. You see, the prospect is simply trying to find out how to lower their mortgage payment to offset that $500 payment in other debt, they're basically making room for their net income. But the only way that they can, they can understand in lowering their mortgage payment is by asking for a lower rate. They have no idea there is another way. And, but it's not our job to jump in right away and start selling because we can't go in for the kiss until we're ready. Does that make sense? 
And so if we then use that as a bridge and say, okay, well, how much are you sending? I'm sending $500 per month on these credit card debts. Oh, got it. How much do you owe roughly, right? You see how this becomes funnel questions. And these questions are going to, are going to funnel you down to their deepest desire. The emotional state that's actually pushing their decision making to buy. It's going to expose their real reason as to why they're going to give you urgency and why they're going to follow you. So follow me. They're going to say, um, well, I owe about 30 grand or 25 grand in credit card debt. Then you could say, okay, got it. So if you're sending $500, is that the minimum or is that above and beyond what's due? Now, the answer to that is, again, going to share with you their emotional state and people, you know, if you've ever heard the saying, people buy with emotion, but then they justify it through logic. And so this method is going to share with you how to attach to that emotion by just that answer alone. So, for example, if they say that I'm paying the minimum, then what you can do is say, oh, e, right? You can almost change your tonality and stress that, oh, there, you know, there's something wrong with that. And then they're going to listen to you even more because, again, you're positioning yourself as a professional. You could say certain things like, oh, e, okay, well, let me see if I could help you first. When you pay that $500 per month and it being that minimum, how much do you have left when all your bills are paid? Then they're going to tell you a specific number and that number is tied to the emotion that they're trying to relieve. You see, people take actions typically to either find find gain, like find pleasure, or put themselves closer to, closer to pleasure, or they, they make decisions based on avoiding pain. Does that make sense? So when we understand how their train of thought is, because that's not like ours, we, you know, $100 to us could be completely different as opposed to $100 to them. Our job in the initial sales conversation is just to understand their thought process, understand their ties to money, understand where their, more or less their fears are and where they perceive that their gain or their value is going to be. And we could do that by, by asking these particular questions. So if you're not writing those questions down or if you're not asking these particular questions in your sales conversation, you're not positioning yourself to be the one who has the solution. But anyway, if we go back and we say, you know, how much uh, net income do you have left? Okay, I got about maybe $1,000 left in net income. Got it. And so with, with that $1,000 that you have left over, where do you put it? And they're going to say, oh, well, we keep it in the bank. Now this becomes a bridge to ask a very personal question. Okay, so if you have $1,000 in surplus per month, how much do you have currently built up in your checking and savings? Does that make sense? So you're actually, you're now allowing yourself to ask that question, and it's all based on these questions. But see, the problem is, though, is sometimes we move into a sales conversation where we immediately start qualifying based on their request. And so if this person, Mr. Patel, requests a 2.25 30-year fix, we not only defeat ourselves, but we deteriorate our confidence because number one is we know that's not available. And then number two, we feel the need to explain why it's not available. And if it, even if it is available, then we start qualifying our prospect. Because instead of focusing on, well, why does he want that lower rate? Because that reason as to why he wants that lower rate is ultimately the reason why he needs our service. And so if we discover that his understanding of having $1,000 in surplus really equates out to having no surplus, because we ask the question, how much do you have left at the end of the month? Where do you put it? I put it in savings. How much do you currently have in savings and checking now? This is probably the most powerful question that you can ever ask one of your prospects because it will let you know their own limitations. It will let you know their own boundaries. And when you identify that their goal is to help increase that surplus so they can find the solution to help them avoid the pain of not having surplus or not having money, then now you position yourself as selling solutions, not selling rate and payment. Because when you can identify their emotional buy-in or why they make decisions or why they're going to buy, then you can easily overcome their objection to price, rate, and fee. You see, I've used this technique for so long, not only in my personal life, as I shared with you, you know, the way I grew up and the way that I was able to get things that I, I wanted, 
but now I actually use it in communicating through my prospects in getting what I want and what I want them to do is not pay attention to the rate fee or payment. And this is what has allowed me to literally avoid any objections on rate fees or costs. And I believe it's effective because I change their belief patterns. I shift their focus away from what the mainstream has trained them to focus on and that's rate and fees. And instead I have them focus on me being the only solution because all I've done was simply expose and control their emotion. Make sense? So they're going to give you cues on like, well, I would like to save a couple hundred dollars or they would say, I need to save a couple hundred dollars. Does that make sense? There's a difference and the key word is either like or need. Sometimes they may say, instead of like, they may say want. And this is gonna gauge of how important it is for them to get that solution. As a matter of fact, if you pick up on these words, and this is a little bit more advanced technique, this is more science, if anything. If you're able to pick up that they say they need, then you need to understand why they need it. And that becomes the sense of urgency. But more importantly, you're able to reiterate the words that they use. So if you use that funnel question and you find out that they only have a couple hundred dollars in checking and savings, and you're going to be amazed how many of our prospects literally only have a couple hundred dollars in monthly savings, we can then latch on to that desire of them wanting to avoid pain or the fear of not having money. You see, when we position our product and our service as the only way to provide them more capital, more more access to cash flow, then we become different from our competitors who are primarily focused on selling rate, fees, and price. Make sense? And so we can carry on that same philosophy or that concept when we go into a sales pitch because we have to identify who exactly is the one making the decision and typically the one who's making the decision are the, is the one who's tied closely to that number. The reason why I don't pitch right off the bat, right within that first couple hours or even on the first phone call is because I understand the power of emotion. I understand that and oftentimes when I'm doing a sales conversation or that initial application, the prospect really needs time to absorb that message. They, I need to leave them in a state where they are curious if I can help them but yet have a feeling that whatever I deliver is what they get. And this helps me avoid the idea that they can get better elsewhere by simple words that I plant in the conversation, such as reminding them that all banks, all lenders, all brokers go to the same entity, and that's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, VA, or FHA. The only reason why most homeowners in their area use us or my, my company is because of our relationship or our access to faster service, lower costs. Does that make sense? These are all the primary concerns that they have and, and you're just announcing them. It's your way of basically melting the objections before it even happens. But you're doing it to their subconscious level. You're not waiting for the objection to happen, you're actually addressing it so they don't need to happen. I hope you really absorb that message. And so by the time it gets down to pitching, you're methodical and you're strategic, so you are making sure that the right people who, who actually make the decision are present at that time. And by doing this, you're gonna avoid the one major objection of I just wanna talk to my spouse about it because now you have both parties there. More importantly, if you, if you break up from doing like a one call pitch or a one call close, even though some of us think that that's an accolade or a milestone to someday reach, I, I want you to understand that you are, are giving yourself a disadvantage because number one, you don't know what kind of environment they're in to absorb your message and you need their attention so that they can emotionally feel the need for that solution that you bring. Because when it gets down to selling the pitch or presenting them with your service or your rate or your fee or your product, you're not presenting it in a way that it is an option, you're presenting it in a way where, hey, I think I, I found something, I wanna run it by you, get your feedback on it. You see, the most powerful way to sell something is to make the person believe that they came up with the decision. Make sense? And so, you know, for those of you who've watched my content or even invested within my course, 
you're going to know that I don't open up my sales conversation with, hey, I got a couple options, grab a pen and paper. I never do that. That's taboo. Although that's how most loan officers actually open up the sales conversation. For those of you who are watching and actually work with me or who have invested in the course, you're going to know that it's more strategic. It's more about positioning. And the best way to position it is, is by positioning it with less, with less friction. And how you do that is you don't put them in a state of mind where emotionally they need to protect themselves. And you're doing that subconsciously by saying, hey, I got a couple options for you. I worked up some numbers. Grab a pen and paper. I'm going to run that by you. Because in that mind state, if you're delivering your pitch in that way, you're doing it in a way where you're just trying to serve what they want. And you're more focused on the rate, fees, and, and, and cost, not necessarily on the solution. But you need to really understand that the message you're giving is a solution and it's not about serving rate, fees, and price. You know, we're a banker, but we're not necessarily negotiating price. We're simply giving them access to the solution that they so desire. And if you do it correctly in the first conversation, you're going to expose exactly what they desire. See, there are certain things that we could pick up on that we may overlook, like how much they got left in checking and savings, how many kids that they have, what are the ages of these kids. These are things that can tell us how to sell them. What do they do for a living? So for example, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm working with someone of authority, like let's say a police officer or a manager or an executive, I'm not going to talk to them or converse with them in the same way that I would talk to let's say a customer service rep or a nurse. With an executive or a person of authority, I'm going to communicate with them how they most often expect to be communicated with, with respect, kind of like a veteran, right? If you speak to a veteran, it's always good to call them Mr. Jones or Mr., right? Because it's a sense of, of, of respect and honor. And if you talk with like a, a police officer, their whole, their whole mind state is all about protecting and serving. So I may sprinkle words within my pitch that says, in order to defend yourself, in order to protect yourself, in order to serve yourself. These are words that they can relate to and they look at in a whole, a whole different light than what you and I would. But I use these words so that they can understand, much like how I use the words that they use when they explain their fears or their desires. So if they use the, a word like, let's say, outrageous cost, I understand that that term outrageous or that word outrageous means to them something they want to avoid. So I can use it, I could use it in my pitch. Well, what you want to do is you want to avoid these outrageous costs from all these other lenders. Make sense? And, and now I'm actually relating, creating a bond to them. Same thing with uh, identifying their kids. How many people actually bring that up? And if you spot that they both work and they both have kids, then we can understand through empathy that their goal is to probably create a solid foundation for their kids. So that should be sprinkled within our pitch. More importantly, we need to pay minds to things and costs like hobbies and daycare that don't show up on the credit report. And if one of them is a homemaker, then we need to leverage that information as well and say, since you're the sole income in order to protect yourself, in order to serve your family. Does that make sense? So those are the words that, that are ultimately going to have them emotionally bought into your message. I can't stress that enough. If you're not presenting your message in this way, then of course they're going to be focused on what the rate and the fees are because you're just a number to them. But if you've managed to find a way to be the resource or, or the bridge to a solution that they need to protect their family, that is going to create the emergency buy-in. But more importantly, it's going to create this bond that gives you the loyalty. So you don't have a prospect that's going to shop you the second that they hang up. They feel so heard that they are convinced that they don't need to restart the, the process elsewhere. Here's the bonus. They feel so served and so enlightened and so, so content with the way you crafted your message that you now have a client for life. So whether you're helping them buy a home or you're helping them refinance once, this becomes your book of business. And if you do it right, they also become your cheerleader to promote your service and recommend you to their friends, their family, and their coworkers, and their neighbors. You see, 
if you do this correctly and you understand that what we do is serve solutions, then you can look at your pitch and your, your, your closing in a different way. When you understand that selling is actually serving, you're going to create this energy and this connection with your prospect that has them sensing you are not someone they should protect themselves from, but someone they should rely on for information. Much like how we view our doctors or our CPAs, our accountants, our insurance agent. We rely on them because that is our go-to. We need to position ourselves to be that go-to for these prospects. And these are some of the helpful ways to do that. So that's pretty much the end of this, uh, this training. I, I know we went over about five minutes, over 30 minutes. I can go on for days. And what I want you to really take away from here is that there is a science to actually closing sales to make it so effectively easy that it becomes automated. And so I want to ask you, what if you knew a way to, to melt objections before they happen? What if you knew how to craft your delivery in a way where they don't, they don't care about your rate, they don't care about your fee, they don't care about your price? What if you knew how to set up your pitch in a way where they're eager to buy, where you can confidently hand off the baton to your assistant or confidently give them a, a list of tasks to do and know that they're going to treat it with the utmost urgency. If that would equate out to even just a couple more sales per week, per month, what financial return would that have for you? It would have a great deal of a change in not only your self-confidence, but how you look at your product and your service. I believe that if you have confidence in what you're delivering, it's going to radiate through your tone and they're going to buy in because buyers, realtors, prospects, anyone we're selling to just wants certainty. And we could deliver that certainty if first we believe that our message is exactly what they need, not necessarily what they want. So if you want to learn more about how to use emotional intelligence, I invite you to click the link below for the Formula to Six Figure program. Take this time to invest in yourself and learn of a better way to do your sales origination. Learn and understand that there is a more effective way to create these relationships that continue to feed you. If you want to know what it feels like to be a top producer, if you want to get yourself to that next income bracket and income level, you need to click the link below and go figure out what it what you need to do to get your hands on that formula to six figures. Let me show you everything I know. Jungle slide.